Hello Internet. Thanks for joining me on this first installment of a Civil War series that I'm starting. So to kick it off, I decided to cover the Battle of Drury's Bluff, which is commemorated here at this well-preserved NPS park, which is part of the Richmond National Battlefield Park Group, which consists of 13 Civil War sites uh, around Metropolitan Richmond here in Virginia. It's conveniently accessible and right off of I-95, about 8 miles south of Richmond. The Battle of Drury's Bluff was the first naval engagement on the Upper James River to test the defensive capability of the Confederate forces to defend the Confederate capital of Richmond. Fort Darling sat 90 feet over the James River and was positioned at an ideal vantage point to overlook a sharp bend in the James River. The defending forces, with the use of three large guns, they had one 10-inch and two 8-inch columbiads could pinpoint the precise location where Union ships exposed themselves as they moved up the James towards Richmond. Then they could blast the ships at will, and that they did with great accuracy. So you can see right here, uh, this was the 10-inch gun as it looks out. It, it's pointed right at that bend where the you know, Union ships would have been exposed for the first time. So I'd like to provide some context. The Battle of Drury's Bluff occurred on May 15, 1862, which was right in the middle of the Peninsula Campaign. The Peninsula Campaign was a major Union operation conducted from March to July 1862. It was an amphibious operation led by Union General George McClellan, where operations were conducted on the James River, the York River, and the smaller Chickahominy River and mostly took place on the peninsula and in Richmond's surrounding areas. McClellan had amassed a huge force at the southern tip of the peninsula at Fort Monroe. And as he moved north, he was partially successful, but the closer he got to Richmond, the more intense the fighting became. And at Drury's Bluff, the U.S. Navy was stopped dead cold. The defeated Navy flotilla consisted of five vessels. Those five vessels limped back south. And this sent a clear message to General McClellan and the Union Army that this was going to have to be entirely a land campaign. So you can now see that this smaller battle had very large strategic implications. The Union forces, especially the Navy, were ravaged by the CSF Virginia as this Confederate ironclad controlled the Lower James and Chesapeake. But since its destruction only four days prior, we'll get into that in a minute, the U.S. Navy had high hopes that they were going to just cruise right into Richmond, up the James, and control this, com this inland waterway to completely assist McClellan's land campaign. So let's contextualize further by looking regionally and seeing what was driving this battle. I just used Google Earth, and I, it's a modern map, of course, and I just removed the labels, but it still works. Back in April of 1861, President Lincoln ordered a complete blockade of all southern ports, and after Virginia seceded, the port of Norfolk and the larger Hampton Roads was blockaded by Union vessels. So let's take a look. You can see right there at the entry to the Chesapeake where Union vessels guarded entry. This was primarily to prevent the Confederate states from foreign trade, uh, so to prevent trade and commerce. This worked well for a while until... USS Merrimack, a Union ironclad, which was ported at Gosport Navy Yard, now Norfolk Naval Station, was taken over after secession and converted to the CSS Virginia. Well, the CSS Virginia was a very powerful platform, the first ironclad, in fact, is the Merrimack, and so much so that it began to push through the blockade. Then the Union revealed its ace in the hole, the USS Monitor. So the Union ironclad was brought to Hampton Roads from up north, and immediately upon arrival, it sought out the Virginia, and the two ironclad, ironclads fought viciously on March 9, 1862. So that battle was kind of a stalemate, and it revealed that the Confederate, while well, the Confederate Navy then knew that its reign of supremacy in the Chesapeake and the Lower James was over because it had met its match. So it got even more difficult for Confederate forces, and specifically 
the captain of the CSS Virginia because he knew and his pilot knew that with a 22-foot draft, there's no way that the Virginia would be able to navigate upriver in the James as it narrows. And with the monitor down south in Hampton Roads at Chesapeake Bay and in the, and in the lower James, it had met its match, so it probably wasn't going to be able to maneuver much down in this area. So you can see right here, this is Craney Island directly across from what would have been Gosport, now Norfolk Naval Station. This is where it was actually scuttled. It was beached and blown up. The captain, Captain Tottenall, had to make the difficult decision to have the Virginia blown up so as to not let her fall into U.S. Navy's possession. I quote, Boys, Norfolk has been taken by the Yankees and our supplies are cut off. Although the vessel has been lightened, the pilot says he cannot get her up to James, as we had intended to do. Therefore, we have concluded to blow her up. You can make your escape the best way possible. Captain Tottenell, May 11, 1862. So now, with the infamous and highly effective Confederate ironclad, the CSS Virginia, out of service, the Confederate forces really didn't have any additional inland waterway defenses for Richmond and the Lower James and the Chesapeake Bay, the entire Hampton Roads area down south was all completely dominated by the U.S. Navy. So Fort Darling and Drury's Bluff up eight miles south of Richmond had better work or McClellan and the U.S. Navy would have a prime corridor for entry into the Confederate capital. So understand, and I have a friend that always says this too, and it's so true, that inland waterways, these waterways you see here, these were the highways of the 19th century. So this was it. Um, so we're looking at eight miles south of Richmond. This was the last defense. So that's what makes Drury's Bluff, Fort Darling, and all this, um, this four hours of activity that happened right here on May 15th so important. Another interesting fact is that some of the guns from the Virginia were salvaged and moved upriver to Fort Darling to augment Fort Darling's firepower. So if the CSS Virginia was scuttled on May 11th and then the battle took place on May 15th, that would have meant that they have had to get those guns um, all the way from down at Craney Island in Norfolk up to just eight miles south of Richmond in four days. So that's quite a logistics feat. So it would have been around May 12th, 1862, that the Union flotilla assembles and then departs. So that would have been commanded by John Rogers. He assembled the five ship Union Navy flotilla to attack Richmond. These included the famous ironclad USS Monitor along with the USS Galena. That's an ironclad that was essentially a wooden hull covered with wrought iron plates. So it wasn't a true ironclad, it was actually a wooden hull, but it was considered an ironclad even though it was only plated with iron. And the, the armored steamer USS Naugatuck, and then the, the wooden gunboats, the USS Port Royal and USS Aroostook rounded out the fleet. So um, they departed the Lower James with Site Center Richmond. They encountered some resistance along the way, namely at Fort Powhatan, which would have marked the end of their first leg of the journey. This was mostly harassing small arms, uh, fire from rebel forces on the banks of the small outpost. Uh, the fire was countered pretty easily by the gunboats though. The five ship flotilla would have continued up to James for the next day to two days until they arrived at Drury's Bluff, weaving their way through the bends, encountering some small arms fire from harassing rebel forces along the way, but nothing noteworthy until they finally arrived at right here at the infamous bend right as they approach Drury's Bluff. This is why I like uh, Google Earth. You can kind of get some positional perspective. But this was, as I read it, and I looked at a couple of old maps, the, uh, the general formation, the Galena was out front as it was the flagship. And as so it took the lead in the formation, which was a, just a devastating position to be in. This, the Galena was a fairly sizable target at 210 feet long with a 36 foot beam. It was an ocean going vessel. Um, it had just been commissioned and fortunately this battle cut its service life to a brief three years. It took 47 hits. The monitor was slightly um, protected by the bend and a little bit uh, to the rear 
it helped out the Galena at some point and did move forward to try to take some of the fire. Um, but its guns were positioned so low that it wasn't able to uh, do any damage to Fort Darling as it was up a 90-foot embankment. The Aroostook, the Port Royal, and the Nagatuck were so far back that they remained out of range of the 10-inch gun and certainly the 8-inch guns. So the Confederate forces were comprised of soldiers, sailors, and Marines and were led by Confederate Captain Augustus Drury. He was the landowner that helped establish Fort Darling two months prior, only two months prior, um, in anticipation of this advance. He knew it was coming. The Confederate forces knew it was coming. Um, they had also placed some submerged obstacles right here. I think I've got a picture of it. Yeah, right there. So you can see it's not that good of a picture, but you can see that there are some sunken vessels right here. So even if the formation would have gotten past um, or actually fought their way through, they still would have had to contend with the submerged vessels. So the 210 foot long Galena probably would not have been able to navigate past anyways. But all in all, Darling had eight guns to defend and use them expertly. During the four hour battle on May 15, Fort Darling pounded the Galena, which remained stationary. And Galena took 47 hits. So the casualty report was 14 dead and 10 wounded. This decisive victory helped Confederate forces gain superiority over the Upper James and defend Richmond very well. So no attempts were made by the U.S. Navy over the next two years, um, all the way up until the end of the Civil War. The Lower James, however, was a different story. With uh, CSS Virginia out of the picture, the Union Navy had full range access, uh, once again, of the Lower James and Chesapeake Bay. Fort Darling, though, was um, built up over the next two years. And due to its success and strategic position near the capital, it was made the Confederate States Naval Academy and the Confederate Marine Corps Instruction Camp. Another odd fact was that civilians were brought down on tour boats from Richmond. So you can see Richmond right here. I guess they would come down on tour boats and actually tour the now famous Fort Darling and even picnic there and tour the earthworks and barracks. Kind of an odd fact to it. Anyways, I hope that you enjoyed this video. I'm approaching the 15 minute mark, so that's kind of my cutoff. Uh, I don't want to make these too long. I could talk about this for another hour easily. Uh, I plan to make many more military history videos in the coming months. Uh, this video begins a new category on my channel. Thanks for watching and see you next time.